Stephanie, um, it's a pleasure having you here today. Welcome to the latest edition of um, Founders Talk. This is the last. This is the last one of this cohort, um, and so what better way to end it than with with you? Um, so what I like you to know is that, me. Oh, oh man, thank you. I feel like <laughs> I feel like we should be paying. No you, pressure there not. either. Yeah, no pressure at all. Um, <laughs> especially after I say what I'm about to say. Uh, so rally, rally. Uh, the reason why we exist is to help um, passionate entrepreneurs transform their ideas and existing work into sustainable ventures that create positive social change. Um, that's why we exist. And then also simultaneously, we had this wild and crazy thought that, um, that we're making happen, which we believe that Orlando and Central Florida can be um, an international hub for social entrepreneurs. And the reason why we believe that is because we feel like we have all the right talent, the right people, the right networks for anybody in that social entrepreneur journey to at least make a stop through here. Um, hopefully they'll stay. If not, at least they should make a stop through here, right? Like Atlanta. Um, <laughs> so, so you are um, one of those people that we are showcasing to the world. Um, and so there's no pressure on you. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, cool. So the way, the way we like to start these things off is um, a, a question um, that you don't get a lot, but you, um, maybe, maybe you've never gotten it, but um, at least get the start, discussion started, which is we want to talk about um, baby Stephanie. Um, who is baby Stephanie, right? Like, what is the environment baby Stephanie grew up in? Um, what are all, the, what, what is that environment and the influences that, um, that when you think back on that, cultivate to you, cult cultivate, cultivated you into the person you are today. All right, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's a great question and definitely haven't been asked that before. Um, you know, I, when, looking back, I think um, what was really special and I guess kind of the way to describe, um, you know, the way I grew up was I was one of um, four girls. I was the oldest of uh, four total shin girls, uh, which is my maiden name. And, um, you know, I, I would describe it as, you know, my mom was phenomenal. She was a stay at home mom for, um, you know, most of the time that I was growing up. Um, you know, she managed to also still, you know, go and get her PhD and she managed to still, you know, do work and then eventually, you know, get into full time employment as my youngest sister got older. What I thought was interesting was, again, she just did a great job of balancing all of that and maintaining a household with, you know, four girls while my dad worked full time as a veterinarian. Um, you know, and so I think seeing her active and, and busy and, and, you know, kind of maintaining these different spheres of life um, certainly imprinted on me. And the other really special part was, you know, she just, her name's Sally and Sally's amazing. I love Sally the human being and my best friend now beyond being my mom. And Sally, you know, just always up for an adventure and always had art supplies close by. Um, mm -hmm. Always was, you know, eager for us to try and do different things. And I also look back and I can really appreciate that, you know, growing up, in the 80s, um, I think before it became kind of a more of a buzzword or a new philosophy, you know, we, we were raised without, um, I think, kind of gender conformity. Um, you know, I don't think we were ever told, you're like, oh, we're girls, we're supposed to play with that or do that. And no, we can't do that. You know, my mom and my dad were absolutely, I think, very empowering of all of us. And so I think it took me becoming a young adult, and starting my company before I realized that, you know, there's some real barriers, um, you know, to women in business and it's changing mm -hmm. every day and it's getting better. But when I started off, it wasn't that way. Um, you know, and, and so we, again, you know, I think we were also extremely um, lucky and fortunate that we grew up in a, you know, a household with both of our parents. Um, I did for most of my life. Um, my parents did end up getting divorced, you know, when my youngest sister got older, but we all still benefited from having that uh, very nuclear, you know, kind of yeah. upbringing. Did, did, what state are you from? Florida. I'm a Florida girl. Okay. If you, Grew so up you're, in Brevard County. Okay. Rockledge. <laughs> okay. For some reason, I got the notion that you were from somewhere else. Um, I'm not sure why I would I think that. I just love to travel now, so. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure if you were like from New Orleans, because you have some roots in New Orleans, which we can talk about it's my new later. second city. Yeah, your new yeah, second city. Yeah. I didn't know you were like Columbus, Ohio. 
Um, but okay, that's that. Now, so was your parents entrepreneurs? Yeah, I mean, my dad uh, was or is. Um, he just retired, but he created um, his veterinary clinic, and so he was a veterinarian for um, gosh decades and uh, just retired last year. My mother, um, while she worked in education, she also though was an entrepreneur when it came to art. Um, and so she mm. you know, would create and take commissions and sell artwork and she still does. And so we absolutely had those great role models of you know, small business ownership and um, you know, kind of being able to, I think, expand and be agile, you know, in, in terms of creating things and, right. and being able to turn that into an enterprise. So so how big of the influence do you think the art was on, on who you are today in terms of branding and marketing? Like yeah. like I consider those creative things. Um, yeah. do you do you think it was massive. Okay. Massive. And I, I'm really you know, especially now having kids, um, I think about it so often of just like, gosh, how blessed, how blessed I was that um, that was put in my life and in front of me. So I mm. could experiment and explore and learn and use that. Um, but what was also interesting was I really had this very clear moment um, and an epiphany when I was in um, 10th grade. And I was commissioned, I don't know, it's, you know, I'm a little bit older than some of you. I don't know if you guys remember Jungle Jim's restaurant and bar I used to be at Church Street, totally, like Buena yeah. Vista. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> so, <heard> I, <laughs> so I will credit um, Sharon Hadley, who um, uh, is no longer with us, um, but I will credit Sharon for uh, hiring me to paint a mural for Jungle Jim's Church Street. And so in 10th grade, I spent my whole summer painting these panels to you know to do this massive mural and prior to that i was dead set on i was going to be an orthopedic surgeon i mean that was it That's i just knew what i wanted to do and i always thought i love art but i can do that on the side and then i can be a surgeon and after that summer i was like there's no way like i want to do this all the time and doing it on the side wouldn't be enough and so i look back and it's like that was a huge pivotal moment for me and if it hadn't been for that and it had been the earlier stages of just having access to art supplies and having a, a, you know, parents that would encourage it. And then having some awesome, you know, public school art teachers and just teachers along the way that also encourage that. Um, you know, I, I absolutely would not be doing what I'm doing today. Hmm. What do, what do you, you, you think it's a paint? What's that? You think it's a paint? You know, not enough, absolutely not enough. It is definitely one of those things where, um, you know, I, I've got to dig back into it and I do find myself, I've got all these projects and all these concepts in mind. I just got to get them out. You just got to get them out. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. So, the, so the orthopedic surgeon, like I'm, I'm a believer that there's like, like I wanted to be a dentist. I always talk about this story. Um, and then I was a science major and then I switched gears. But I, I think back, people always ask me like, well, like, like, how does that apply to my life? And I found ways that it applied, like, and, and, and I understand how I got influenced to do that or why I, that I thought that was something I wanted to do. What, what, what was the thought around you becoming an orthopedic surgeon originally? Like, mm -hmm. like, what was the influence? And then like, if you look back on that, there was something about it that you still hold today. And, and so like, what was it about orthopedic surgery and how does it connect to who you are today? Yeah, um, you know, I, I would have to say, I believe it started with my dad and um, being a little kid, being up at his clinic and he would do surgeries. And so oh. it was common for me to pull up a seat and literally, you know, on a bar stool and just kind of sit there and, and watch him do surgery. And yeah. um, it was fascinating to me. Um, and I think that absolutely inspired that. And then I really, I think, you know, I found just the ability of helping people, um, you know, particularly when it comes to injuries, you know, and being able to um, do something that's that exacting and it's that vital um, and that it has that sort of an impact um, was also really inspiring to me. Um, and then there was interesting, there was, you know, towards the end of my, you know, fascination with surgery and specifically orthopedics. Um, I'll never forget, I want to say it was like 
60 Minutes or you know, one of the, the news program stations um, did this special on a doctor who was reconstructing um, faces essentially from the inside out. And so it was mm -hmm. just at the time it was really revolutionary. Um, and just that to me was like, oh my gosh, like that's sculpture and it's medicine. And so if there's anything, there's like, that's the one thing I will say was kind of like, whoa, yeah. that's possible. But then the mural came around and it was like, all right, well, I love this. So I'll just keep doing this. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Um, now, so you went, you went to college, um, what did, uh, school, what, what, what did you study there? Um, so my, my educational journey, um, I, I will say this too, I'm, cause I think I'm a huge advocate for it. When I was in high school, I ended up doing early admissions. So I wasn't, um, a traditional senior in high school that, you know, was, you know, digging into the senior culture at high school. Um, I ended up taking a full schedule at the local community college, Brevard Community College, and it was totally paid for by the school system. Mm -hmm. So by the time I graduated high school, I had 42 hours worth of studies complete that transferred to Florida State. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was huge because I found that it helped me just as a particular person and learner I was, it kind of helped me get a little bit faster into the things that I really wanted to learn about now. So I started at Florida State and I was actually there um, enrolled in the art program, fine art program, and very quickly realized it wasn't, that's not who I am. <laughs> I'm a little different than that. And I was really fortunate because there were two professors that I had uh, at the time that also recognized my skill sets and kind of my thinking against, you know, other, you know, people in the program and just kind of the overarching, you know, program focus. And we're able to really coach me and help me and say, hey, have you ever thought about, you know, graphic design and commercial art and illustration? And I, it was all Greek to me. I just knew I liked art, but I didn't know what type of art. And so if it weren't for them, I never would have been catapulted then to UCF, which is where I ended up transferring after that first year FSU to UCF. Yeah. And, um, had a phenomenal experience there under uh, Chuck Abraham, um, you know, who I adore as a wonderful professor. And, and that it truly became exactly, you know, the, the education that I needed, um, you know, for, for my journey. Yeah. Um, so, so let's transition us from, all right. So it was like art, orthopedic, wait, selling rabbits, orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> mural painter, fine arts, then it's like, oh, this, this other element of it, which is more business related. Um, mm -hmm. So let, bridge us to, from there to like where you, cause you started Prismatic pretty, pretty young. Um, so bridge us from, yeah. from there and like, what was, what, what happened that you said, okay, like I'm gonna start this company and then how did you get to like, how did you get the branding and then what made you want to start Prismatic? Yeah, great question. Um, I would say probably it kind of started when I was in high school and it was doing those side hustle creative projects because mm -hmm. um, I kept doing some here and there. It started more mural based, um, but with time that also became illustration. Um, and then at UCF, um, I had the opportunity, Jungle Gyms was opening a restaurant in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And I was given the opportunity to go there and basically design, install, do it all. And there was no way I was gonna turn that down. Um, that just seemed like an incredible- So they're gonna give you an opportunity to design, install, wait, oh, the mural that goes into- No, the... more than that. Okay. I mean, it was literally, how's the signage gonna look? How's the interior gonna look? Oh, um, wow. So I got to design signage, murals, faux finishes, sculptures, I mean, those, you name those it. restaurants and, were awesome too. They had like, it was very like- They're crazy. Yeah, they were crazy. <laughs> it was like big elephants you could sit on. And like, it was like, uh, it was a cool spot. That's fun. Yes, yes, absolutely. And so like one example was um, there were these like uh, elephant foot shaped stools and those were the bar stools. Um, and so- it was amazing was, you know, this opportunity came up and scared the heck out of me on one hand too, because it's like, whoa, I don't know how to do that. I've never done that before. 
And so I was able to work with um, Chuck Abraham at UCF, who um, essentially enabled me to shape this up as um, you know, basically remote learning and continued learning. And so it became kind of a very intense you know, semester's worth of project that I could still earn credit for. Oh, and I had to document cool. everything, report back on everything and really show just process all along the way. Um, but the, what was awesome was I didn't have to take time out of school, could still parlay that into earning credits um, and yet could earn income and could actually do the things that I was wanting to do. Um, and so that project was everything and then some, um, you know, I mean, it was crazy. I have like yeah. a scar on my leg from stabbing myself with a knife in the middle of like carving a sculpture one day. So <laughs> yeah. it's a great adventure. <laughs> wow. Um, one, I yeah. love, I love Stephanie Darden Bennett's connection to Jungle Gyms. This makes me very happy. <laughs> Two, oh, I love awesome. like, I love an entrepreneur's story that starts from a place of like real passion where it's like, I had this idea to do this thing that would be really successful, but I couldn't get away the fact that I really just loved doing this work. Um, would you, this is kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but like, have you had to balance, uh, here's things that I love and here's what has to get, get done in order to run the business. It feels like that's probably always yeah. a balance, but I wonder how you strike that balance. Absolutely. You know, and I, I think there are certain parts, especially over the years, um, growing the business, you know, there's, you know, as, as I'm sure everybody here can relate, you know, when you're in growth mode, I mean, sometimes it's like you're wearing 20 hats and the hope and the goal is that you can maybe end up wearing, you know, one hat, or two hats, three hats, maybe. Um, and so, you know, I would say one of those, um, you know, one of the hats has definitely, I think anytime I am, you know, which is kind of gets interesting, but if, if I could only wear the design hat or I could only wear new business development and sales hat, I would be miserable. Um, what I found is I have to have both. And it kind of cracks me up to think about it because it's like, oh, I fantasize about being a surgeon, but in doing art on the side, well, I still am using the right and left sides of my brain on a daily basis. And if I don't get to do that and I only use one, I'm actually not happy. Um, you know, and so I would say the, the area of business that, um, you know, has traditionally been a struggle would be more of the administrative sides of things, you know, that take me farther away from my passion and they're just more perfunctory. Um, and so, you know, yeah, I would say, you know, HR matters um, and accounting matters. Those are all, you know, parts of it that I've had to learn. I've had to do myself over the years, but boy, am I glad to not have to wear those hats, you know, constantly and be able to wear the ones I really like wearing the most. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, it does. And I had to look up perfunctory. I was like, um, that's an interesting <laughs> word. <laughs> I was like, Oh, carried out with minimum, uh, minimum of effort or reflection. joy. Yeah, that's that's. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna incorporate that word today. Thank you. Um, uh, so, so, yes, perfunctory wasn't your thing, um, and and so you, you got this opportunity to jungle gems, jungle jungle gems, and then from there, um, you, one day said. Um, when did it come to, to mind that this is branding and that you wanted to do it for your, like, did you work for a company first and then jump to Prismatic yeah. or was it, okay. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, I, I would say the the journey of discovery to into branding is something that took a while. Um, you know, I would say the first focus was within illustration and graphic design. And so um, out of school, I ended up going to work for a, um, it was an internal marketing department of a Fortune 500 um, company subsidiary that focused, um, it was called um, Career Shop. And the subsidiary was Personnel Group of America. So um, means nothing now in these days because yeah. ultimately when the dot-com bubble burst, so did all that. And so my first job out of college I'd had for four months and then got laid off along with 
you know, a substantial, you know, uh, population of, of um, employees and was just devastated. However, again, side hustles are huge and I still advocate it for my own teammates. I want everybody to have their cake and eat it too. And I want everybody to just keep building, creating and doing outside of our daily, you know, journey together. And I'm really glad that I was doing that myself then. Um, I was actually doing um, storyboarding and illustration work for a company uh, called US Color. And they did a lot of work in educational industry. So like school book publishers, Harcourt was a major client of theirs. And so I would get these you know, freelance projects that involved sketching out and storyboarding illustrations. And so when I got laid off, um, I'd been, you know, doing some work on the side for them, you know, probably about a month or so. And I was like, oh, heck no, I need a job. And so I happened to have my portfolio in my trunk. I literally drove down there <laughs> and I was just like, hey, I, I, I'm looking for a job. I just got laid off. Are you guys hiring? And um, the two sweet people that I, you know, worked with there were kind enough to introduce me to the production manager. Um, so I met with him there on the spot for a few minutes. Um, and that went great. And then um, probably, you know, 30 more minutes later, I ended up meeting with the owner of the company and talked my way into getting a job. And so um, by the next day, I started working there. And, um, and that was a really important job because it helped me get from, I would say, more illustration and design into art direction and creative direction. And um, so joining them as a graphic designer, um, I was there for about a year and a half and through that journey ended up becoming an art director where then starting to get into more, I would say applying, um, you know, uh, business concepts and strategies to the creative work that's being produced. So, go ahead, Ben, were you about to say something? Oh, okay, okay, I saw your mouth move. Um, so, so ultimately that, that led you to a point where you're like, I'm gonna start Prismatic. And so I want to briefly just talk about that, but I want to get to like, ultimately we'll, where I would love to get for us to get to is, is to understand how do you think about branding, um, your philosophy on it, and then talk about tangible ways or practical ways that entrepreneurs vary at the early stages like how should they be thinking about this approaching this because i always and it could be a mistake and you'll let me know i'm sure but i've always talked about brand thought about branding as something like later on um but i keep hearing that it's not something that's like later on but um and so we would love i would love to get there but first let's let's what caused or precipitated prismatic being that born next yeah yeah um all right, so had been working at US Color. Um, another moral to the story is keep in touch with people, don't burn bridges, you know, build your network. One of the companies that I had also been doing some freelance work with and who thought, you know, kind of looked at hiring me at, at one point, um, I kept in touch with them and I heard from the owner and he was selling his agency. And um, was just letting me know that and also saying, hey, if you know anybody who's interested in buying, let me know. We're looking for a change in life aisle. And so that kind of struck me as like, whoa, that's incredible. I wonder what it costs. I wonder, you know, what, what that involves. Um, and so as a result, went down the path of kind of exploring that and figuring that out and figured out that it's not for me. You're buying somebody else's book of business, somebody else's relationships, their culture, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so actually on, on the guidance and, and help and support of um, my dad and my uncle Mike ended up starting up a business. So I recruited um, at the time, just so happened the company that I was at, um, ended up doing some layoffs. I maintained my position, but one of my teammates ended up losing his. And um, I really enjoyed working with him and um, and so in this process of thinking about creating a company, I knew that at the age of 22, you know, I had a lot to learn. One of the best things my uncle made me do was take different meetings with lenders and see if they would give me a loan to start a company. Boy, was that humbling, <laughs> super humbling. It was kind of like, oh, 
<laughs> yeah. Single girl, that's such a great idea. <laughs> um, and but it was awesome because I got to just see like, all right, what's that involved? And it's not easy, and it really sucks. Yeah. Um, and so it in going through this process, I was very very fortunate um, in that my uncle. Um, had been a serial investor in in family members businesses over the years and um, helped me crunch the numbers and figure out what it would take you know what is the bare minimum it would take to get this off the ground and running and um, so he became an investor in the company I recruited my old teammate who had been laid off and started up what was then Foresight Design Group um, and back to your point of when does branding begin and end? A perfect story is starting up my business. You know, here we are at that time, more graphic design focused. My uncle's helping us incorporate. Mark and I came up with a name for the business. And then we designed the logo, business cards, and we were rolling. Well, no one ever completed a formal trademark search on the name. So about a year and a half into business, we got a cease and desist letter which was like seemed devastating because by then we'd been accumulating clients and um, we actually just landed Bank of America as, as our first big name client that we were working with. And so it's just like, oh my gosh, to change our name now, I mean, we look like idiots for one and for two, you know, what are we going to do? And so uh, the quick fix that we took, because even then I wasn't a brander then, I really wasn't, you know, I think as focused and passionate about branding as I am today. Um, and so we decided Foresight Design Group would become FDG Creative. And that was our workaround so that we weren't rocking the boat with clients that we had and just landed by completely changing our name. And yet we could keep rolling forward. And um, that served us well for a while until um, I think it was 2014 when I finally ripped the Band-Aid off and uh, we formally rebranded ourselves as Prismatic. And so branding has to start at the earliest possible stage. And, you know, the, for a myriad of reasons, the least of which is it works in tandem with your business model. Um, I mean, with branding, when we start off on these projects, you would be surprised the proportion of our time that goes into research, um, analyzing competitors and role models, developing personas for who your target audience is going to be. And after we have all those insights, you know, determined and assembled, only then do we start to get creative. But there's so much research and background work that goes into creativity, absence, strategies, malpractice, you know? And so we've got to map out the game plan and understand it thoroughly. And, and most importantly, branding helps create competitive edge and distinction in the marketplace when it's done right. And so, um, so yeah, got to start branding super early wow. at the very beginning. <laughs> wow. I love, I love one thing I, I, before we get into that conversation about branding, which I'm so happy to hear you talk about it that way. Um, it's like the, the notion of you going to those bankers to try and find the loan also like makes me think of you in 10th grade painting the mural at uh, jungle gyms. Like, like this willingness to just like go in and figure stuff out. And the more entrepreneurs we meet, the more convinced I am that that's like a trait. It's like, I'm willing to go in and solve this problem. And whether it's, whether it's because I just really love the, making murals and creating things, or I just really think this problem needs to be solved and someone, no one else is gonna do it, or um, mm -hmm. it, that, that kind of tenacity has to be there in order to get over the hump of starting something. So it's really fun to hear that as a thread throughout, throughout your story. Um, <laughs> And then uh, like the branding thing is like so fun for me because we've been having a little bit of that conversation about like how, how do you help entrepreneurs think about brand identity? And, um, and the thing that comes to mind immediately is most entrepreneurs that we come across have some notion of their brand identity. They have a name they really love 
they have an image that they may or may not be connected to. They, they know roughly why they're starting their company. Do you feel like that it, how, how does it hurt them to go unexamined into starting the company with that notion of who they think they are as a business? Yeah, I, I think it, it can be, um, I think it's more of a rarity if you're lucky and you're fortunate and it works out. Um, and when I say work out, it means from not having a trademark infringement and copyright issue to truly resonating with the audience that you need to be able to attract and that you're, you're there you know, to service. Um, but then it even gets deeper into this by way of what do you stand for? And does that, I think, you know, one, one thing that can be really tricky in this is a lot of times, you know, when a lot of these decisions are made, most of the time we see they're coming from an emotional space. They're not necessarily coming from a practical um, strategic space. And, um, and so I think that's, that's really the, the biggest thing to think about is you know, it, it's not about, and I mean, here's something that seems really simple, but you'd be surprised how often this becomes a challenge for some. Just because you like pink doesn't mean your audience likes pink. And, and I mean, it, it sounds simple, but boy, I mean, that's, that's the truth. Um, you know, and there's people that we often have to kind of talk down from the ledge of, yes, but let's think about who's your audience. What are they after? What, what's their decision-making process? How do they think? How do they feel? What do they gravitate towards? And then what are your competitors doing? What are gaps and opportunities that you could capitalize on and you can leverage? And so I think the danger is, you know, if we keep that internalized or motivated by instincts and, you know, rather than facts and also just kind of your emotional uh, pull, it, it can lead to making missteps. And the goal is obviously to avoid missteps. And you know, the one of the the real important elements of, of why we brand is to build brand value and equity and um, integrity. And if you have to start changing the brand, you start dabble with the integrity. You start dabbling with you know perception and equity that you worked really hard to earn. And so. None of us want to have to redo things once we're moving full speed ahead. And I think that's, you know, one of the more critical mission elements to, you know, doing and engaging in really thoughtful strategic branding. Yeah. Um, so I just want to pull back real quick because I, this is this conversation is, is, is headed to a good place, uh, but I just want to lay the foundation of it. So you define branding is what, if you were to say what branding is, what would you say it is? You know, one of the common ways I refer to it is, you know, branding helps us identify your personality, your promise and your position for the world. Your you know? personality, so, your promise and your position. Is yep, it a, is that business. something? Yes, or a person. <laughs> okay. And then, and then how is branding expressed like that things your per wait say the gifts what was those three things you per, per, per promise personality promise and your positioning per okay and then and then and then the expression of that is creatively or like what are what are ways that yeah. that is expressed yeah great question um it is expressed in i'll say this to me branding is the filter by which anything and everything you're doing runs through. And, and I even mean, if you're writing a job description to hire someone, it better run through your brand filter to make sure that you're using words that are consistent with your belief system, your personality, your promise, your position. Um, and so I would say there's not any, there's nothing in business that brand shouldn't touch and an influence and help guide. Um, I would say though, in terms of just common like how do you and how do you get started um the most common forms that that takes for us when we start to think about it is building blocks and creating the foundation that businesses can and individuals can you know rise above or rise on top of would be we focus on brand voice and brand visuals so brand voice would be things like we spend time thinking about 
the keywords, those words that matter to who you are. And, you know, I, again, each of us has our own set of, you know, our, our vernacular that we lean on, you know, that the lexicon essentially that we're utilizing. And, you know, and so those that know us well, you know, understand and see that and identify it. Same thing with business, same thing with your brand. You know, it is taking a look and understanding what words you should be using because your audience needs to hear them. You need to leverage because it ties back to who you are and also how you're distinct in the marketplace. And then also infuses personality, you know? Um, you know, I think the personality piece to me is one that's often missed. It's that kind of intangible layer to branding um, that absolutely matters. And, it, and it's not saying that you know, a CPA, oh, it's a CPA, it's a business, you know, you can't have this personality. That's not true anymore. I mean, there are certain elements of that you expect in the CPA company personality um, and honoring those, but at the same time, are you intuitive? Are you like kind of people driven? Are you great at breaking down complex into, you know, concise understandings? I mean, that all goes into that particular brand mm -hmm. and position. Um, and so we do also taglines. And my favorite piece is what we refer to as a brand manifesto. Imagine a brand manifesto as um, it's this short, sweet, passionate, um, almost like an elevator speech, you know, on who you are, what you stand for, and, you know, and the impact that, that you're making. Um, and and it, what's great about that is once you've carefully crafted that, that's get that get you it get used everywhere. So from videos to website to you know any type of content from a marketing standpoint, that's ripe to be utilized and leveraged. And then on the visual side, um, you know we're looking at clearly logos, um, also fonts, colors. Um, how are you you know presenting yourself on social media? What's that visual look and feel, which is super critical now. Um, so again, brand voice, brand visuals tend to be the foundational kind of deliverables, if you may. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm glad you broke it down that way. Um, I like that. I like that manifesto thing. I mean, I, like I, I'm passionate about manifesto. I wrote a credo for myself and my company at the very beginning that guides everything, you know? Yeah. But yep. But um, one of the things that, that we found after working with social entrepreneurs for a while is that in addition to like being helpful outwardly, communicating outwardly, a, a lot of times entrepreneurs, because of like what we talked about, entrepreneurs are the types of folks who run into situations either because they love it or they see the, the problem that needs to be solved and they kind of build the plane as they're flying. They like figure the thing out entrepreneurs tend to make a lot of decisions intuitively and sometimes their their motivation and their strategy uh, can be right on but but completely unexamined and if you take mm -hmm. the time to craft um, like what you're talking about a manifesto um, then then it's it's easily accessible for you it's it's a good outward speaking tool but yeah. what we find also is it connects you to your motivation really well so when you come up to a complex problem that doesn't have an immediate solution, then you have this little handle right here where, where it's very easy to remember why I'm doing the thing that, I do, that I'm doing, what I believe in, how it connects to this product or service that I'm delivering. Mm -hmm. um, and so we end, we end up with a little formula. I, I didn't think about it in terms of brand, but it's, it talks about, you know, I believe in this sort of thing. The problem is everybody addresses it this way. And so our solution will be to address it this way, right? And, mm -hmm. and giving people a little handhold like that, I guess it's interesting to think about that in terms of brand identity, but it is kind of like the yeah. core conviction or motivation or promise of the company. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I think Absolutely. it's like dual. It's like inward helpful and outward helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the... Yep. Um, yeah, I think, and then a lot of the tools that we're doing, when you talk about like who is the customer, it, it, you know, puts a kind of a, a stamp on why that work is important, that customer identity. And one of the things we talk about is, um, is um, we do use a customer persona, right, um, as, a, as a tool to help them better understand, like, 
you know, demographically who the customer is, what their fears, challenges, things like that. And what I'm understanding is that we've always used that as a document in order to build a product or service that resonates with them, right? That fits. But it's also important because that's an element of building your brand, right? Um, and yeah. so, um, and so, we need to just keep using that document. Uh, so, yes. <laughs> um, critical. yeah, Super so, critical. so what I want to, I want to talk about, okay. So personality promise and, um, the third thing, position, was, position <laughs> uh, personality, promise, position. Um, so as early stage entrepreneurs, um, what, what will be your recommendation or wisdom on like, what's the, how do, what's the process or thought process that should go into examining those things, those three things, personality, promise, position? Like, how would you approach that as an early stage entrepreneur? Yeah, um, you know, I, I love Lord of the Rings. I think we all need to have a fellowship of the ring. <laughs> so I would say, you know, again, understanding, particularly now, I mean, you guys have a cohort, you've got a, you know, a group assembled here, there's a fellowship of this ring, you know, to tap into and utilize. Um, but I also think, you know, each of us um, tends to know people in that have either interaction within influence within or awareness of um, kind of our industry. And and so I think looking at those people as an important peer group that could also be leveraged to help test out concepts, proof it out, um, you know, that's, that's all a really important aspect as well. But I think, again, it, it's just, it's being willing to kind of roll up your sleeves, do a deeper dive, start to look at and build upon those personas, which it sounds like, again, you're already working on, which is tremendous. Um, and then, I would say another big part of it is, again, doing some great competitor profiling and then also doing some role modeling. You know, role modeling is just as important and role modeling to us does not have to be the same industry. Role modeling can be looking at Patagonia because boy, you know, do they have just, you know, what it means to be a good, a business for good down pat. Um, and so what are learning lessons that we could pull from them as a role model, you know, into what we're endeavoring to do with this business. Um, so I would say, you know, to me, those are the three things. It's, it's assembling your, your peer group that can help you kind of as a working group map out and test out, um, you know, what you're developing, conducting the role modeling, you know, conducting your competitor reviews, um, and then being willing to continue down that process to just flesh out you know your brand architecture so the the personality component does a personality is the personality becomes a byproduct of that work it starts to shape or are you also also you know, because yeah. you see it you see an opportunity you say mm -hmm. all right well traditional banks are like this i want to maintain some of these these pillars but one of the things is that maybe there's a newer generation of individuals who don't like the staunchiness of that and so I'm going to use a color like purple. Like there was a company that used purple. I was like, that's crazy that they used purple originally. But they really stood out to me mm -hmm. as a banking organization. Yep. So I was like, well, why would they use purple? Um, so so how, how does one derive to like the personality? Um, how does the personality come out of all of that work? Yeah. Well, I think personality to me is a byproduct of the spirit of the entrepreneur, as well as then proofing that against your target audience, mm. your competitors and models. And so I, I don't think it's relegated to this or to that. I think to me, it's, it's a byproduct of the examination of all of this, right. because I'm, and just to put it as an example, um, you know, as, especially as a startup, you know, startup, you're, you know, the founder, the leader, you know, it's inevitable that their personality is going to be a part of the mix, you know, of the culture of this business. And so if you're someone that let's just say is very reserved, very responsible, very analytical, then to create a business that is completely opposite of that, and that is revolutionary and is high energy and is energetic and da, 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 that's gonna be a big reach. 
And so if that is the case, and if that is what your industry needs and your client base wants, then it's evident that your team around you is gonna have to be able to exude that and, and, and live that. And so again, it, it's, I think it's part entrepreneur and it's also part you know, looking outwardly, but you have to, it's gotta be logical. It can't be this imaginary invented la la land thing you know, that, okay. that's created out of thin air. But that makes me think about um, Microsoft and Apple. And when I think about those two products and the evolution of them, you the thing about the 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 founder, the founder's personality becomes a part of the yep. personality of the organization. Like I can see that in those product products, especially when you start to learn about Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Um, you can see how Microsoft is very just corporate-y, kind of just nerdy and just, you know, it's very utility. And <laughs> and mm -hmm. Apple is more, does all that, but has this, this kind of like this edge of coolness on it because, I mean, Jobs was a different kind of personality, right? Then very different from, mm -hmm. from, you know, he wasn't a programmer, whereas Bill Gates was a programmer. Right. So two very different personalities, mm -hmm. right, um, came out into the product. So, Absolutely. So yeah, that, that's actually interesting. Um, okay, so so sitting down, examining personality, promise positioning um, is one of those things. Doing competitive analysis, um, understanding um, who you want to role model, um, who understanding who your customer is and what they want to see, testing some things out. That's the first first step, and then and then what other wisdom would you give for an early stage entrepreneur um, along this journey? Who you know, like all, all things being said, like they don't have like how do they not like? Because you talked about like not um, doing something and having to unravel it, but I, yeah. I feel like there's a little bit of tension there because things are so changing within, especially early stages of their business. That's why, like, I think it feels like I'm a little hesitant yeah. to, to yeah. do that. So, like, well, how far should you go without having to do it all over again if things change? Yeah, well, and that's just it. You nailed it. I mean, it's it, we are living in the life and times of agility and evolution. And, you know, things are going to look very different one year from now. And if anything, the rate of change is, as you know, we understand it is exponential. And I think the last... 16 months have proven that. Um, and so the brand has to grow with you. The brand has to evolve with you. However, you have to start off by creating a foundation or there's nothing to build off of. And so I think that's, you know, what's really important is to, and furthermore, when you, you know, thinking back on brand, it's who you are, what you stand for as well. And that shouldn't change. That shouldn't be something that continues to wobble. I mean, that there it's really identifying, you know, the core pillars and value system that's at play. Um, and that is going to evolve, but that's not going to be changing wildly. And I'll, I'll give you a quick example too. Um, you know, there is a, there is a client that we've worked with that, um, you know, has a great brand and, you know, they've, you know, there's been, you know, changes along the way, you know, in terms of teammates and, you know, kind of composition, that sort of thing. The industry has remained the same. Um, products, you know, remain the same. If anything, they're adding some more to it. Um, you know, but there's also been this desire to, well, let's just completely redesign. And, and our question has been, well, why? Like, why? Is something not working? Are we not attracting the right clients? Are, you know, is there a signal that something needs to be fixed and something isn't quite right? Because that clearly then leads into rebranding and brand refinement and brand, you know, kind of just recalibration. Um, because the opposite of that is, if you just decide that you just wanna redo the logo, logo just for the sake of redoing a logo, there's a financial cost involved in that. It's gotta be, spread across any and all own channels that you've got, all marketing materials. And then furthermore, there's gonna be places out there on the World Wide Web you can't touch and you can't edit because somebody else owns that, but yet your old brand's gonna be there. And so, you know, and, and thinking about this further, you just are now starting to, you know, chip away at credibility, integrity, 
um, brand equity, you know? And so when a client starts to learn about a new business and they go one place and it looks like this and it says this and they go to another and it looks like this and it says that, that's not a good signal. If anything, that shows you don't have it together, you're pivoting, you know, there's some things at play here that are not, you know, on a strong trajectory. And those are all negatives when it comes to, you know, being able to really strengthen, hone in and, and just own, mm -hmm. I think, a brand. And so that's that's why I think it gets scary, you know, on getting too far down the road and refangling everything as opposed to there's absolutely going to continually be the need for recalibration, adjustments, but that's far different from a complete redo and a complete rebrand. Gotcha. Yeah, I really like the way that you're talking about that, Stephanie, because like so much, we, we talk about a little bit, the top of this business model canvas that we use has this purpose. And that purpose is where we kind of pull out that manifesto for founders in the, the what we talk about is like, we, you fill out that first because all these other things that come underneath it, customer, problem, cost, revenue structures, all that stuff could evolve. But, but mm -hmm. your, your purpose for launching out into the world on the company, if that changes, you're doing something different. You might as well start yes. something different, right? Yeah. And I, so I like the idea that, that brand isn't an image maybe that's connected to a product or something. Brand is this building block that's built off of why you're doing the thing that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And if you build it that way and connect your language to it and your, your outward presentation to that, only so much of that will change. Um, but it's Perfect. important to have your virtual presence and your physical presence built off of this full knowledge of what you're talking about. I don't know what you're like, can, can you, are you able to share a story when that went really well, where you're like, all oh, these people really aligned it really well and we're proud that we worked on that? Yeah, um, gosh, boy, it's so funny. It's like picking a favorite kid. That's yeah, it's so yeah. hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> those are the questions I always bomb. Um, my goodness. Oh, it's funny. You it's know, easy for I... me to pick my favorite kid. That's funny. <laughs> it's easy for me too. Yeah, I right? one. Well, I've got three. Um, so. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I will say, you know, one of the, um, you know, it's kind of a, a different way of looking at it, but I, I, I am totally comfortable in saying it's one of our favorite children um, <laughs> is actually the, the reason why, you know, Kyle brought up New Orleans and that is my adopted second city now. And I spend time living there part-time in Orlando part-time. And, um, and it all began with a project that um, was a complete, um, um, basically complete new master plan development and community reinvestment initiative that was spurred from Hurricane Katrina. So Katrina came through and there was the former St. Bernard public housing development and Katrina left it with between six and 10 feet of water throughout the property, depending on the topography. And so um, what had prior to Katrina been completely antiquated and just inappropriate, quite frankly, housing for people to live in, um, created an opportunity to redevelop that and revision it and bring it up to modern standards and standards by way of mixed income housing. Um, and I will say just, I'm a huge affordable housing um, champion. I believe that mixed income housing is utopia in the sense of it truly is a community where everyone is sharing in the successes people are sharing in, you know, when things don't go right. And so we all have a vested interest to work together to make a community, you know, thrive and be healthy. And mixed income housing provides that opportunity. Um, but so that project was one where we came into New Orleans, I'd never been there in my life and we came in two years after Katrina. So the neighborhood itself was still completely ravaged. And um, there was no viable market research and data there. Just to put it in perspective, when we started doing our research, postal service had only been restored to about 50% of the area. And, um, and so census data was inaccurate, mail lists and data was inaccurate. You know, we just, we had nothing we could work with. And so 
um, we set out doing what I would describe as hand-to-hand -hand combat research. And it was anyone and everyone that would talk to me um, or my colleagues, we would dig in, we'd ask them a ton of questions and that helped us begin, in, you know, begin to get more informed. Um, fast forwarding, you know, kind of our goal there was extremely challenging because we entered New Orleans, which was a market that had never witnessed a, a successful, affordable and mixed income housing. There had been one attempt previously, and by all accounts, it had been a disaster. And we also entered an environment where the first meeting I had there was the police sergeant saying, you guys better build a 20 foot wall around this because I can't keep you safe from the neighborhood, and blah, 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 blah. And the developer's amazing. And they're like, no, the community wants an open street grid. We want this community to be restored and whole. And um, so we had naysayers. We had people who didn't understand and didn't believe in affordable and mixed income housing. And then we also had to magnetize part of mixed income housing there was a third public housing, a third affordable and a third market rate. So we had to be able to attract people who could decide to live anywhere they wanted in the entire city to come and live in an area that had been known as the hotbed for criminal activity for years and years. And fast forward, um, we were successful. We, I mean, we, you know, kind of obliterated the performa that the project team had for that. It became a national award winner. Um, and it, more than that, it houses, at this point, you know, we have over 600 units there, housing seniors, housing families. And so it's, it has truly done what the philosophy of mixed income housing should do. Um, people and families are thriving there. The community is turned around. It's now safe. There hasn't been any criminal activity or any violent criminal activity on site since its inception. Um, and the fifth year anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, President Obama chose Columbia Park to go and be the set for where he gave his speech. Um, and so very proud of that project. And I think it's a testament to research that had to get done no matter what, and having to have tenacity to figure it out, <laughs> doing the research and then thinking about what's missing and, and what are the pain points and also you know, what are the red flags that we could really screw this up if we don't communicate X, Y, Z? And then thinking of it, the next step was how diverse that particular audience was. And interestingly enough, the audience we had the hardest time attracting to live there actually became the public housing residents. And, um, and that was something that was unexpected and it had so much to do with the fragmentation of people who were scattered everywhere because of Katrina. Um, but then also just the standpoint of seeing this place and how can I, how can I live there? How can I, mm. how can I belong here? Um, so that was, that's definitely one of my favorites. Yeah. And, um, and I think just a good example of the strength of we, we rebranded a neighborhood, we branded a place, we had promises to make, we had a personality to get out there and we had a position to own, you know, within that marketplace. Yeah, that's awesome. I really appreciate that. I know our fellows are probably pining to ask a few questions. So I'm going to open it up. Um, if any of y'all have some things, um, Marco Polo, Matthew McConaughey, Shay Shay. Um, <laughs> I can chime in. Um, thanks for the wealth of marketing knowledge. I love the, I guess, three extra P's you use to identify the marketing mix. So I really like that. Um, just to speak a little bit about that, and this might sound random, but uh, you guys, for those that are in Orlando, you might have seen the, uh, is it Harold and Harold, or I'm, I'm not sure, maybe Morgan and Morgan, where it says size matters. And so I just, I was very shocked to see a legal team use such a sexually charged message. And uh, I, I just love your thoughts. I mean, if you want to speak about something completely different in an analogy, that's fine. But I'm just, mm -hmm. because you mentioned personality is a big thing in marketing, I, I firmly believe that. I feel like yeah. when, is, when is a legal I'm going to actually take that step out. And that's like my first venture I think I've ever seen a radical message mm -hmm. from them. So just, um, yeah, yeah, I'm just curious about your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting. I would go back to the founder. 
if it was Morgan and Morgan, I can't remember now, but if it was, that particular founder is known for being avant-garde and bold and outrageous sometimes and not afraid to stick his neck out. And so I think it aligns quite well with not only his brand, but also clearly, you know, the personality that he, you know, is setting, you know, for his firm. Um, you know, and I think it's, and I, I've noticed, you know, from time to time, there are those opportunities that um, you can stick your neck out farther if you're comfortable doing so. And if you're agreeable to doing that, there are a lot of people who shy away from that. Um, I think it, it has to, though, ultimately just tie back to, does it make sense? Does it ultimately make sense? Or is there, is there a, an audience that's big enough that would be attracted and, and find that appealing to utilize that as kind of our method for being a disruptor, you know, when it comes to our brand and our marketing. And, you know, if the answer is no, then clearly it's not, not the right direction to take. Um, and I, you know, again, I've found from time to time, there are people that they just don't care. I mean, they're, they're, they're gonna do it no matter what, they wanna do it their way no matter what. Um, I'll give them credit for, you know, for that. And, um, you know, but ultimately the, the, the real test of it is just whether or not the audience itself is going to be attracted to that and is gonna find value in that. And I think when you talk about particularly personal injury and you talk about just the mass marketing nature of what that campaign does, um, there are a lot of people, you know, that would find that humorous and, um, and really would instigate, you know, their interest. So it works for them. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Yeah, we got time for one more question, Nathan. Go ahead. Um, that your your experience with with Columbia Park, I mean, just really astounding. How did you get public housing, HUD? How did you get everyone to agree on on messaging? I just can't imagine the stakeholders that are involved in that initiative. Yeah, it, it's interesting. You know, we we have a variety of clients and industries that we work within, but um, places have been a big part of that since day one. And then within places, affordable housing, you know, has been a consistent one as well. And to your point, there's often a myriad of stakeholders uh, surrounding a project. You know, I think it's, it's been interesting. That's a particular situation where the, the review and the approval and just kind of the, the stakeholders were relegated to the development team. Um, and the joint venture partners. So there was actually a community organization that was a party to that. And Columbia Residential is the master developer. And so it was surprisingly um, not that challenging because they had such a specific fellowship of the ring established you know, for that particular project. Um, but we have you know, led into other projects that have a much more um, even community engagement aspect to you know, what we're doing. And, and I think those are just prime examples to where, I think Lyft Orlando is a, another extremely successful example of what community engagement should look like and how it should be executed. And at, at the end of the day, the magic, you know, that that, that can possess when it's done the right way. And another project um, that I'll quickly give you an example on is Pittsburgh Yards, which is a project that we're working on in Atlanta and it's in the Pittsburgh neighborhood of Atlanta. Um, and what's significant about Pittsburgh is it was one of the earliest um, black areas in New Orleans. So it was a thriving black community for decades and decades. And over the years, you know, unfortunately they were plagued by just vulturistic activities, particularly when it centered around property and real estate and homes. And so fast forward to today, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, um, as well as other on the ground project partners have um, been working diligently for years with the real motivating audience and kind of drivers of this project being the community. And so the community had so much more than just, I think a seat at the table. They actually were the ones that had the table and we're driving the meetings. And so fast forward to today, Pittsburgh Yards is the project that has been created to serve as a business incubator, predominantly for black owned businesses with the express purpose of catalyzing economic prosperity within the neighborhood. Um, you know, and so I think engagement, you know, requires a lot of energy, uh, a lot of management, but it is absolutely well worth it at the end of the day. 
Oh, man, that's, this is all good stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that um, baby Stephanie, the rabbit breeding baby Stephanie, <laughs> decided not to be an orthopedic surgeon uh, to, and <laughs> chose to live here instead of Brevard County. So it was great having you. Um, yeah. You helped us um, elevate our brain, you know, promise, positioning, personality. Um, and so I appreciate you spending time with us today. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed getting to know you all and being here this morning. It was a real privilege. Mm -hmm.